Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name's Shadow Wraith, and today I'm going to be going over the top 5 most interesting heroes to play with, or the most fun. Okay, and this is coming from a number of different people that I've spoken to, and things that I've seen from the Middle Earth Trashy Battle Game community. Now, first of all, before I get into that, my voice might sound a little bit croaky still, but I've just been getting over laryngitis, which was not fun, but I'm pretty much good now, so that's the reason there's been no videos. But I plan to change that, and we're going back to as much content as I can get out as possible. Now, how do I rate these heroes? Well, basically, it... Sorry, the video went all weird, um, the audio. So, I rate the hero on, basically, how fun they are in-game, if they've got anything quirky about them, or any special rules. Um, hopefully this is enough to cover up the horrible noise. Sorry, thank you. Or something that is, you know, unique to them. And then, of course, how fun they are actually in-game. So, if they are an absolute ridiculous beat stick, then yeah, sure. Um, but if they've got some really cool abilities that will just mess with your opponent, anything like that, anything like that. Um, but yeah, jumping straight in. In the number five slot. We have got the Watcher in the Water. Now, 200 points for this octopus. Absolutely amazing model. Recently got him myself just to have the models. Um, he's, yeah, absolutely iconic scene from Fellowship of the Ring, where he basically tears down the entrance to Moria trying to get to the Fellowship. But what can he do in game? Well, he's movement four, which is horrendous. But he's fight six, which is amazing, with a three up shoot value. He's strength 6, defense 6, 6 attacks, which is insane. Uh, he's got 6 wounds and 3 for courage. 1 might, 5 will, and 1 fate. He's an independent hero, but he's a big monster, big octopus. So, yeah, sure, he's not going to be tagging around with a goblin captain. And his war gear is tentacles. Um, along with that, he's got heroic strength for his only heroic action. That's fine. It's quite nice to have a hero character, just in case you want to get him to above strength 6. <laughs> and he's got Harbinger of Evil, so he's minus 1 courage to people. Within 12, I want to say. Uh, resistant to Magic, which is fantastic with the 5 will. And he causes terror, of course, because he's a big scary monster. Now, his unique special rules. From the deep. So he can never be part of another hero's warband, obviously. When you deploy your army... You don't deploy the Watcher on the board. Instead, keep him to one side and during each priority phase, after the priority has been rolled, announce you would like the Watcher to arrive. And roll a d6. On a 3+, plus, the Watcher is ready to enter play. But as soon as you decide you want him to enter into play, but you don't roll a 3+, plus that time, he you have to roll every priority phase after that because he's trying to get up. Now, this is the fun bit. When the Watcher is ready to enter play, immediate place it anywhere on the battlefield, it can displace models. So, you know the tight little shield walls people like to do, Iron Hills, uh, Minas Tirith, things like that. Yeah, you can just whap them straight in the middle of that, and they move any displaced models the minimum distance possible, so that they are one inch away from the Watcher. So basically, you and your opponent take turns in di displacing models, so you move them, so... And it's to represent him exploding from the ground. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Uh, he can't charge when he arrives, but he can set you up for some really cheeky stuff, especially if they've got a really tight formation, holding an objective, something like that. You can bang up this 200-point octopus model right in between their formation and then charge him with the rest of your army. So, many tentacles. When the watcher is reduced to three or less wounds, the attack value is also reduced to three, representing people cutting off his tentacles. Talking about tentacles, in the shoot phase, the Watcher may make d6 shooting attacks. They have a range of 6 inches and a strength of 3, and never require an in the way roll. That is so cheeky. Any model hit by a tentacle but is not slain is immediately dragged into base contact with the Watcher by the shortest route possible, even over the heads of other models. Models moved in this way do not count as having charged. If there is no way to fit the model in base contact, it is not moved at all. The Watcher can still make these shooting attacks even if it's engaged in combat. So my first thought is instantly looking at 
some kind of caster in the back, like Galadriel, for example, if she hasn't got blinding light up, or even if she has, you've got D6 shots. Um, hidden behind a load of shields, you can still grab her and pull her into base contact and go, yep, yeah, you're not staying back there. It goes the same with any hero that doesn't want to get into combat, really. So, yeah, I mean, the Marsh of Lake Town, he loves buffing his boys. Whip him in, shred him up. Another rule which is rarely ever brought up, a Water Dweller. He's not slowed by water features. In fact, his movement is doubled, so he goes up to movement of 8. And he always counts as having rolled a 6 on the swim chart. He also gains Monstrous Charge if he charges in a water feature. And he also has his own Brutal Power Attack. Instead of striking normally, if the Watcher is in water, um, you can select a single man size or smaller model involved in the same fight and roll a d6. On a 3+, plus, that model suffers a wound. Fate is rolled, like usual. If it's not saved, however, the model is dragged into the depths and immediately slain. Yeah. The Watcher is then removed from the board and its controlling player will start to roll for the Watcher to re-arrive uh, re as you would have initially to get him on the board. So yeah, he's really, really fun. Smash through formations, and like I said, he can grab those support heroes out of the back. He can grab that banner, get him out of base contact with other people, stuff like that. Really good. Is he competitive? Probably not. I think he's a little bit pricey. But hey, if you've seen him in an event, let me know and let me know how he did. If you use him, let me know. Now, on to the number four slot. Nice easy one here. It is from Mordor, and it is Shagrat, captain of. Sirith Ungol, 100 points, Hero of Fortitude, and he's absolutely bonkers, I love him. He's got movement of 6, he's fight 5 which is respectable, 4 plus shoot value, but he's strength 5 which is insane, defense 5, 3 attacks, 3 wounds, courage 4, 3 might, 3 will, 3 fate. Really good price. Um, he comes with armor and a sword. He's also got heroic strike, strength and challenge, so strike is really important to get into your lists. And you can give him the shield of Sirith Ungol for 10 points, which you definitely want to do. And you can also give him heavy armor, which will bump him up to defense 7 with the 2. Because the shield, it is a shield. Additionally, in the turn in which Shagrat charges, he gains the knock to the ground bonus exactly as if he were a cavalry model. That's bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. Um, so you can have this orc just going absolutely, well, Urukai, sorry, um, going absolute bonkers, knocking infantry to the ground on the charge at fight five with heroic strike. It's really good. Doubling his strikes up, six strength, five attacks. You can heroic strength if you really want to, but yeah, six strength, five attacks. Horrendous. So good. Is he competitive? Absol absolutely. I've seen him in a lot of Mordor lists. He's brilliant. 110 points. You know, with him in the shield. If you want to give him heavy armor, 115 points. Absolutely great. Great hero. So, that's him. Moving on, we have got the number three slot. And he's probably one of the coolest characters, in my opinion. But I'm biased, because I love Fringwraiths. It is, of course, the Witch King of Angmar. Okay? He ranges between 70 to 150 points, and for anyone who doesn't know, the reason he can be different points is because you can give him upgrades of Might, Will, and Fate. So, what's he start on? He's a Hero of Valor, or a Hero of Legend if he is part of Angmar, obviously. His stats are Movement 6, Fight 5, 4 plus Shoot value, Strength 4, Defense 8, 1 Attack, 1 Wound, Courage 6. He comes with no might, 10 will, and no fate. I know what you're thinking. Absolute trash. But hold on. He's got heroic resolve, channeling, strike, which is awesome for a ring wraith, strength, and challenge. So the strike is really essential there. And, I mean, yeah, you can give him an uh, armored fell beast for 70 points, a fell beast for 50 points. Stick him on a fell beast at least, definitely. The Crown of Morgul for 25 points. I'll go over what these do in a second. An Armoured Horse for 15 points. A Horse for 10. The Morgul Blade for 10. And a Two-Handed Flail for 5. So 
so yeah. Now, going in descending order, the Armoured Fell Beast, basically it's a Fell Beast that is defence 7 rather than 6. For an extra 20 points, it's not worth it. In my opinion, absolutely not worth it. Okay, a Fell Beast, just so you know, is obviously a mount, um, it gives him a cavalry keyword, but it is fight 5, so the same as Witch King. He's strength 6, which is an improvement, defence 6, 2 attacks, 3 wounds and courage 3. Comes with teeth and claws. Special rules of fly, monstrous charge, so giving him three attacks on the charge, knocking cavalry over, and he causes terror. The only downside, and this always winds me up, if you've ever heard me in another video, they automatically fail the courage test if the ring mate is dismounted or slain. Ridiculous. 50 point model. Don't know why that's in there. I know they, they wrapped it up as feral, as a special rule, but like, come on. Right, that's the only downside to it. If you don't want a Felbies, you can go with the Crown of Morgul. I mean, you can go with both if you really want to make them really expensive, but yeah. So, the Crown of Morgul, basically what that does is, if he has it on, his attack value is increased to 3. Additionally, whilst wearing the Crown, the Witch King of Angmar can choose to re-roll one dice when making a casting or a resist test. That is massive, absolutely brilliant if you're going to use him as a spell slinger. Absolutely worth it. And three attacks is awesome. Stick him on a horse, he's got four attacks. Stick him on a fell beast, you know. I mean, he's still only got four attacks, but. Like, I mean, that combo could be quite good. Fell beast and the crown. Because you get the three attacks, you get the resist re rolls and the casting re rolls. And then all your attacks are resolved at strength six rather than strength four because of the fell beast. And you can, you can really, like, go nuts with it. You can rend people with the Felby. So if you've got Dane Ironfoot in front of you, you can just rend him at strength six. Sure. And you can still be striking. So the Felby is really good. And plus you've got maneuverability, which is massive in this game. Getting to you, getting you where you need to be to shoot those transfixes, sap wheels, whatever you're doing, black darts. Absolutely fantastic. Now, the Morgul Blade. What does that do? Well, basically, it's once per game... Uh, you can choose to, to use the Morgul Blade during the fight phase before rolling to wound. If a model is using the Morgul Blade, they must direct all of their strikes against a single target. An enemy that suffers a wound from the Morgul Blade is automatically slain, regardless of the number of wounds on their profile. Heroes may use Fate to avoid the wound, but even if a single wound is not saved, then the model is slain. That's brilliant. Um, but the attacks cannot be used from the mount, so they must be using the rider's attack and strength if using the Morgul Blade. So you can't say, I'm strength 6, and I'm going to rend you with the Morgul Blade. You know, you can't do that. My opinion, not worth it. Once per game, you can fluff it. Um, I mean, sure, you can use it on something really big, like an Ent or whatever, but you're probably not going to roll to wound unless you use all your might or something. Unless you roll really lucky, of course. Um, on top of that, heroes, most heroes have fate, and it's a full plus roll with with might, you know? And you've only got one attack. But if you give him the crown, you want to use the crown with this. If you're going to bring the uh, Morgul Blade, you've got to bring the crown, in my opinion. So, yeah, it's up to you if you use it. I, I never have, but sure. I mean, I've got the King of the Dead, and he does the same thing for 100 points, you know? And... Lastly, he's got Harbinger of Evil, Terror, and Will of Evil. Will of Evil is the worst rule in the world. He just disappears. Every time he gets into combat, you lose a point of will. And if you get to zero, you disappear. I guess that's a balancing thing, because you can give a lot of will to these wraiths. So, just so you know, he can go up to a max of 3 Might, 3 Fate, and 20 Will. Which is amazing. Um, you can The spells he comes with is Drain Courage, range 12 inches, 2 plus to cast, Transfix, 12 inches, 3 plus. Compel, 12 inches, 4 plus. Instill Fear, 3 inches, 4 plus. Your staff is broken, which is really fun. 12 inches, 4 plus. And then Black Dart, 12 inches, 5 plus. Sat Will, 12 inches, 5 plus. Uh, your staff is broken is fantastic against Gandalf, Radagast, any spellcaster with, you know, a magical staff and staff power. Because it just destroys it and they don't get their free point of will every turn. Or they spend all their will trying to stop you doing that and then you do it again next turn. So you can really screw with someone's day. But is he competitive? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
He is really good in Angmar lists, obviously, um, along with Dead Marsh Spectres, um, because you can basically control a player if uh, a enemy's model if they fail a courage test, and he gives a minus one to that. And he is also very good with Gulliver. Gulliver, there we go, Gulliver. He works really well with him, um, and uh, came, I think, top place in there high tier tournament I'll try and find the list if I find the list I'll link it in the description down below but he did really well but he's also good in the mortal army any army Baradur he is absolutely fantastic but the most common way I've seen him being played is you whap him on a fell beast at least and people do like the mortal crown I wouldn't worry too much about the mortal blade and I wouldn't worry about the flail in the number two slot we have got from Gundubat, the pale orc himself, Azog. He is 165 points, so quite quite hefty in the points. He's a hero of legend. He comes with a move of six, a fight at seven, which is insane. So high, seven. Um, yeah, there's not many models that are fight seven that aren't monsters. Uh, but he's strength five, which is brutal as well. His defense 5, eh, 3 attacks, which is great, 3 wounds, courage 5, 3 might, 3 will, and 1 fate. So the 1 fate is not great, but he's got 3 wounds as well. He comes with a sword and a mace, and he's got heroic march, strike, strength, and challenge. Options. Signal tower for 200 points. So if you want to put 365 points into this, you can. The signal tower is fantastic. Very expensive, but fantastic. Only ever seen it in a thousand point games, but I mean, I think it's worth it. Giving the white wag 50 points now, yes, every single day. Okay, I'll get to why in a minute, but you give him the white wag, you just do. Not only does he become a cavalry, so the knockdown bonus plus one attack, all that good stuff, he, the white wag is fantastic. Stone flail for 20 points, eh, never seen people use it. And heavy arm for 10 points. If he's your leader, probably worth investing 10 points into heavy armor. So he goes up to defense 7. Now, what does the stone flail do? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go over that quick. Um, it's a two hand weapon that follows the um, rules of flails with the following exception. Um, when he decides to use the world attack, he is reduced to fight 6, not 1. Okay? Additionally, wounds inflicted by the stone flail do not cause one wound, but d3 instead. And at any any model that is struck, but is not slain, is knocked prone. He has got the burly special rule as well. General of the North is his other ability. His stand fast is 12 inches. And unlike other hero model stand fast, it can affect other orc hero models. And he's got I am the master. This is what makes him absolutely broken. Well, bent. Well, competitive. When rolling to wound an enemy hero after winning a fight, you will never need to roll more than a 3 plus to score a wound, regardless of defense. He is Aragorn, but better. Okay? And saying that, I'm just thinking so the Stone Flail is a two handed weapon, right? Does that mean. He can two hand the flail, use burly so he's not minus one, and wound on twos. Just, yeah. Just a thought. So, yeah. I mean, using it makes him fight six, but yeah. You don't reduce his fight value for well, but yeah. I don't know. It doesn't say anywhere you can't, so if I'm wrong, let me know, because that's absolutely ridiculous. Ah, here we go. I'm going to have to try and summarise this as quick as possible. Otherwise, it's going to be an 84 minute video. You know. <laughs> um, the signal tower has four major parts the banner of Dol Guldur, the banner of Gundabad, uh, the banner of Angmar, and the horn of Gorgoroth. So, yeah, uh, it also comes with seven lieutenants, and they all come with one might, one will, one fate at fight four. So, it's pretty good. And they've got Heroic March, all of them. Um, they all come with Ancient en Enemies, Dwarves, and Elves. So that's not bad. You're getting seven mini heroes for 200 points plus the Signal Towers. 
you basically you place the tower in a position before the battle commences allowing for Azog to command his troops effectively from the start of the battle before deployment but after the players have decided on their board edges you can place a signal tower what do the banners do? well firstly they have to always be manned any of Azog's lieutenants may man a part of the signal tower they have to be in pace contact with the part they wish to man and whilst manned each part of the signal tower has different effects as follows the banner of Dol Guldur all friendly good bad models on the battlefield count themselves as being in range of a banner that is fantastic absolutely ridiculously good banner of Gundabad all friendly good bad hero models may declare heroic marches without reducing their store of might that is ridiculous that is ridiculous just yeah that will get you up the board so quick the banner of Angmar whenever a friendly Gundabad model on the battlefield suffers a rule, uh, wound Roll a d6 on a natural roll of a 6, the wound is ignored. So, yeah, that's pretty good. This supersedes other rules that confer similar effects, like Fury, for example. The Horn of Gorgoroth counts as a war horn. Additionally, all enemy models on the battlefield suffers minus 1 to the courage, but it doesn't stack with similar effects. So, you're all plus 1 courage, the enemy's all minus 1. You get a Fury save. You can heroic march for free, and you will count as being in range of the banner. The signal tower can be destroyed. They've all got like three wounds per component at defense ten. So yeah, and it's it's basically the same as a siege weapon. The white wag. Now, the white wag has got a move of ten because he's a wag. Fight five, which is amazing for a wag. Strength five, defense five, two attacks, two wounds, courage four. He's got three might, one will, one fate. Comes with claws and teeth. He's got fell sight, so you can be charging around corners. And causes terror. Deadly union. Basically, Azog and the White Warg can use each other's stores of might, will, and fate. So that effectively gives you a hero with six might, (laughs) six might, four will, and two fate. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Packmaster, once separated from Azog, only Wag models may use the White Wag Standfast or benefit from any heroic actions. And Raging Beast, when dismounted, the White Wag will automatically pass the Courage Test to their fight and it will automatically pass all Courage Tests for the rest of the battle. Is he competitive? <laughs> yes, very. Maybe not the Signal Tower so much because it's quite a lot of points. I haven't seen it at an event. If you've seen it at an event, do let me know because I'd love to know how it works. I've made my own signal tower because Games Workshop haven't released one. And even if they did, it'll probably be on Forge World and it'll probably cost the same as a car. But it is fantastic. He is absolutely brilliant. He is a hero beat stick, kills heroes. He kills infantry as well at strength five. I mean, if you give him the flail as well. Yeah, on the white wag, six might. It's ridiculous. He's ridiculous. So worth his points, absolutely. Bring him. Always bring him. And on top of that, he gets Master of Battle if you bring in part of Azog's Legion. Like, Master of Battle, like Gothmog, you don't even need to roll for it. Six inches of him, anyone calls a heroic action, copy it for free. Insane. Absolutely bonkers, that guy. And now, the number one slot. This one, unanimously. Like, most people said this guy. And I can see why. I don't like playing against him. I don't own him. But I don't like playing against him. It is Dane Ironfoot, Lord of the Iron Hills. 140 points, which is a steal for this guy. Okay. He's movement of 5 inches, because he's a little dwarf. He's fight 6, which is great. 4 plus shoot value. Uh, strength 5, which is crazy. Defense 8, which is even crazy. Mm, oh, yeah. 3 attacks, 3 wounds, courage 7. He's not running from anything. Three might, three will, three fate, and he's a hero of legend on top of that. The heroic actions he comes with is heroic resolve, march, strike, strength, and challenge. Perfect. And he's got a heavy, he's got heavy dwarf armor and a two-handed hammer. And before you ask, yes, he is burly. He can have a war ball for twenty points, so that makes him one sixty, fully upgraded. He's such a steal for everything he does. Such a steal. Um, the war ball is a slower mount. It's movement eight. I mean, it's fight four. 
shoot value of 5 plus. Strength 4, defense 6, which is great. No attacks, but it's got 2 wounds, which is really good for a mount. Defense 6, 2 wounds is absolutely brilliant. And courage 3. Um, like I said, he's got Burly, and he is indeed fearless. So he's literally not running away from anything. While staying Ironfoot, Lord of the Iron Hills is alive on the battlefield. All Iron Hill dwarves, models within 12 of Dane, automatically pass all courage tests they are required to make. That's Lord of the Iron Hills. Amazing. Really good. Anything to negate courage test is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, going against the Army of the Dead. Like, I mean, it's not a good matchup because they get part of your defence, but at least you're not scared of them. Moria, you're not scared of them. Fiery Temper. As soon as Dane Ironfoot, Lord of the Iron Hills, kills an enemy model for the rest of the game, if Dane is in rage to charge, he must do so if he is able to. Sure, that's great. As long as it doesn't say, charge the nearest enemy model, because then you get into a trouble where people feed you like a goblin, and you end up killing a goblin. And sure, you get a heroic combat, but that's wasting might because of a goblin. And uh, then we've got Fearsome Charge. In turn, which Dian Ironfoot, Lord of the Iron Hills, charges into combat, he causes terror until the end of the turn. So he's a scary dwarf. Very scary dwarf. And he's got headbutt. Basically, if you win a dual roll but fail to slay your opponent, you select a man-sized or smaller model in the fight and roll a d6. On a 5+, plus, Dane will headbutt that guy. Or girl. And the model will be knocked to the ground. That's just hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. And on top of that, if you bring him with Iron Hills... You get the army bonus. Basically, um, you get Master of Battle on a 4+, plus, which is great. It's not as good as Azog, but it's awesome. And I thought it was a good pairing for the last two to be Dane and Azog. Yeah. Is he competitive? Absolutely, yes. All day long. Iron Hills are competitive. They are. They do really well. Um, I know someone personally who came third place at a recent Throne of Skulls. 1,000 point event up in Nottingham where he used primarily a infantry force, I believe. Um, I don't have the list on hand. I will ask him when I can get to him, but we're all stuck in COVID at the moment. But yeah, did very well, did very well. Um, yeah. So that's it. That was my top five most fun slash interesting heroes to play in middle strategy battle game. If you think of any that I've missed or don't agree with any of these, do let me know in the comment section down below. I'd love to know what you think. And if you can think of any more, do tell me. Do tell me. Um, if you can think of any armies that are the most fun to play, let me know in the comment section down below. Because that will be a topic that will be coming up. Anyway, if you'd like to talk about my little strategy battle game, link in the description down below to my Discord servers. Um, yeah, great. Great group we've got in there. So if you fancy talking a bit more about my little strategy battle game, drop down in there. Anyway, thank you ever so much for listening. I do hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, don't be scared to hit the like button and you're fairly especially saintly today do consider subscribing but if you don't do either of those things i still hope you have an absolutely fantastic day and i'll see you in the next video goodbye